So um, I'm here to talk about a project, which is a bit of a work in progress. It's titled Citizen Science for Cuneiform Studies. Oh, sorry. Not used to speaking in mics. Yeah, that's okay. Everyone can hear me now? I cracked a really funny joke in case you missed it. It was, it was brilliant. Um, what can you do? Um, I'm going to start this talk off by talking about what my definition for citizen science is and uh, what cuneiform studies um, are all about. Or maybe not. Do we know why it's not working? I did just then. Oh, it's done it twice. I guess it is. Why does it doesn't matter? They're identical. As long as it works. Yay! Okay. So, so the crucial definition here um, for me is that I don't want to use citizen science as a synonym for crowdsourcing. What I'm really looking at for citizen science are members of the scientific community who might not be professionals, but they are members by definition of joining into a process that aids scientific research. I would like to call them participants rather than volunteers, and if they do anything worthwhile, then they should definitely be accredited for that. New discoveries or their names on publications, things like that. To sort of paraphrase the people from Galaxy Zoo, uh, I would love to have a world where participating in science was considered as socially cool as being good at sports. So there are lots of existing projects already. Um, this one with the ship is um, Old Weather, which is about transcribing logbooks from the British Navy. They've been very, very, very successful. And the bottom one, I'm sure everybody can guess, is from Galaxy Zoo. Ornithologists and archaeologists have been using citizen science for centuries. Basically, volunteers who aren't professionals who have been trained to do the job properly. And increasingly, digital her heritage projects are also tapping in to the power of the masses, um, including Ancient Lives, which is a project to transcribe um, pieces of papyri with ancient Greek writing that have been found in Egypt. So now that we know what citizen science is, I'm just going to explain what I mean by cuneiform studies. So it's a discipline of Assyriology, and uh, we sort of look at the, the archaeology and the, and the philology of written material from ancient Mesopotamia. Cuneiform is the oldest known form of writing anywhere in the world. There are estimated about 500,000 objects with cuneiform writing, but there's only a very, very small number of specialists. The International Association of Seriologists has just under 400 members, and that is a, that is a global sort of specialist community. My area of expertise um, is based around the Earth 3 period, which is about 2100 BC. Cuneiform was in use in Mesopotamia for about 4,000 years. And I'm only looking at about a, a sort of century within that whole spectrum. And all the examples that I'm going to be showing you today are Sumerian rather than Akkadian or Babylonian or Assyrian. So traditional research in Assyriology has been offline, paper-based, journal article publication stuff. Um, you read dictionaries, you read sign lists, like the one from Labat, which shows you how pictures that were pictographic become increasingly abstract over time, and here is uh, their meanings and readings and how they change over time as well. There are an increasing number of digital resources which make this stuff available to people everywhere across the world. They have a great deal to offer in terms of interlinking, but that hasn't really happened. Um, where links do exist, it's certainly not between data sets. It's at best hyperlinks between web pages. And uh, where Cuneiform has been used as a case study for fancy digitization projects, 
Those have been kind of standalone ones, like RTI and 3D scanning. And the sort of field of Assyriology hasn't massively tapped into that sort of thing, but it is all there. Um, I'm not sure Assyriologists are absolutely brilliant at putting together visually stunning web pages. Um, the bottom one here is our equivalent of a dictionary. I'm not sure how useful that is to anybody who isn't terribly familiar with it. It basically gives you a form of the sign and then some, uh, ex some uh, translations. This one for frightening splendor, which I think is a very good choice for how I'm feeling right now. So this is the conceptual model that I've come up with. It is a bit of a working process. I believe that it's going to help us solve the problem of huge, heterogeneous data sets and small number of experts. It's going to have a layered approach, so regardless of what your area of expertise or previous knowledge or area of interest is, there's something for everybody. And basically, what I envision is that at the top here, we have our citizen science participants who have a very user-friendly um, user interface, and their work then helps us generate a massive triple store which researchers at the other end of the system then, then query. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, seriology is a sort of kind of confined skill set. There aren't a lot of people who can read cuneiform and do sparkle queries. So everywhere along the way, we need systems in place that makes it very user friendly. So the examples of the kind of things that I would hope that our participants would do was that they could look at uh, object records, for example, and identify things like authors for FOF records, geographical locations, and object provenance, and link that to existing gazetteers, and then dates for establishing chronologies. One of the problems that we have in Assyriology is although we have records that refer to every single day of the reign of a particular king, we don't have anything that ties those dates to any other timelines anywhere in the world. So whilst we have absolute chronologies within the reigns of kings, we, all we have overall is a relative chronology. We think it probably maybe took place around 2000 BC. If you're not so interested in the sort of archaeology, sort of provenance tracking and museological concerns, you could look at something like learning to read the actual cuneiform script and linking images like this from an object to its Unicode equivalent, or maybe its transliteration. In this case, you would recognize this as a dingir and this as a sign for Inanna. Inanna was uh, the goddess of love and war, which I, tells you, which I think tells you quite a lot about what the Mesopotamian view was of women. <laughs> Can't argue with that. If that it wasn't enough for you, you could maybe do some work helping us doing some cross-referencing of content. So on the left here is uh, a, a known proverb, which roughly translates as um, to, to stand and to spur the donkeys and to walk with the king's son who has breath for that. Um, and on the other side is a quote of that proverb in the literary composition, The Epic of Gilgamesh. I'm not saying that if you applied a narrative ontology and did all these things, that the machine couldn't find these for you. But I think this would be quite an interesting thing for lots of volunteers to do who could then get quite interested about a seriology, which is not very well known necessarily. So the benefits of all of this, I think, are numerous. and fairly obvious. It's not a big discipline, so of course we're always kind of pushed to the sidelines. It would be great if there was more of us. Um, work that we do, research, tends to be hugely time consuming. One of my colleagues spent three years going through museum collections and object records looking for examples of duck weights. That was just three years of looking for data. I think there's a chance of benefiting the wisdom of the crowd. If 10,000 people say something is true, then maybe it probably is. If there's wisdom in the crowd. There could be specialists who have skill sets who we don't know about, or we could benefit from their wisdom. And wisdom from the crowd, which is that people from different disciplines could get together and there's a bit of, sort of synergy of coming up with something new and brilliant that we haven't thought of before. And 
because I am a big fan of semantic technologies and linked data, I would hope that this would be something that would give us a big set for getting linked data, at least, linked data ready data, if not something more. So I was super confident with this, and I was like, this is brilliant. This is going to revolutionize everything. And earlier on this month, I had a chance to pitch this to some cuneiformists, digital cuneiformists, a linked open data event uh, in New York. And after my talk, the cuneiformist from Berkeley came over, and she looked me straight in the eye, and she said, you have got to be joking. Well, I don't blame her. There's a lot of problems with the data, which I'm going to talk to you about. Her concerns were concerns that I brought up as well when we were planning this. And, uh, and hopefully, you'll get a better idea of the kind of things that we're struggling with. So the difficulty with cuneiform is that it's really hard. It's really, really difficult. The data is heterogeneous, it's fragmented, and it's incomplete. We have a syllabic script, not, not an alphabet, but syllables. And you need to know hundreds, if not thousands, of these to be able to de decipher a, a given text. The signs can be visually similar. I mean, these three, I feel, are quite similar, but in meaning they are not in any way linked. The visual similarity is just a, a coincidence. And the signs are also polyvalent. Now, what this means is that e any given sign has a number of unrelated readings and meanings. They are phonetically unrelated, and they are semantically unrelated. It's just things like the sign for foot eventually started to mean to walk, and then it meant something completely different, like, uh, well, I don't know, to travel and then to dream and so forth. It's a, it's a pain. <laughs> So the correct reading of everything is hugely context dependent because of this polyvalent nature. And as an example for here, we have the sign for shesh, which means flagpole or brother. You can make some assumptions as to why those two signs are used by the same, same glyph. If you combine shesh with unuk and the key, which is the determinative for location, you don't read the, the cluster of signs as shesh unuk key, you read it as uri. And the two here tells us that this is the second most common way of writing the sound uri. It's not the only way. It's not even the most common way. It's just a way. And then, of course, there are instances of the same signs, but in different orders and combined with different signs, as the reading now, nana, which is the god nana, the god of the moon. Now, there are other considerations as well, and this was actually the slide that I was most nervous about, and this is what the cuneiformist from Berkeley was most nervous about as well. There are links to other academic disciplines. One of them is Egyptology, that everyone tends to know a lot more about. Well, more people have heard of it, certainly. Uh, biblical studies, which can sometimes maybe give you a particular perspective on some of the data that we have. Our, one of our sort of worries is that because Assyriology has such a, a low public profile, we're simply not going to have 20,000 people desperate to participate on our project. And then, of course, there are those people who I've decided to call alternative theorists um, who look at cuneiform data. Um, if you're bored or anything like that, I'll just ask you to go on YouTube and check out Ancient Astronauts. That's that's all you need to know. So I said, OK, fair enough. These are very, very acceptable fears and considerations. I have no quarrel with them. And this is how we're going to get around it. We're going to have training as an intrinsic part of the project. You simply can't contribute without doing the training. And we'll have different levels of difficulty and different types of activities. And then hopefully the people who have trained to become good at this stuff will stay for longer, will develop new skill sets, and uh, will have you know, sort of a greater uh, extent or greater percentage of retention. We'll have social media, which will uh, encourage communication, not just in terms of the volunteers and participants being able to talk to experts, but that they will talk to each other and tutor and mentor each other. And they will say, hey, um, this thing, I've got a problem with this. Does anyone know what this sign is? 
This is what I used to do when I was a, a student, an undergrad student. I would call my friend at four in the morning, the day before the exam, and say, what's the third sign on the fifth row of the third law of the Code of Hammurabi? And she said, don't call me, and hung up. But yeah, only online, they can't run away from you, you know what I mean? Um, we can also build, uh, we can build into some reward schemes and, uh, and hopefully that will, that will encourage greater levels of activity and greater levels of accuracy. Certainly the people who were in charge of old weather said that they found that a simple badge system and a captaincy of a ship, that, that's log book they were uh, transcribing, um, worked really well and people were very eager to maintain captain status and thus contributed more to uh, the project. We we'll also calibrate the data. We're just not going to take it at face value. But if we have all these other things implemented, then hopefully the quality of our data won't be so terrible to start off with. And a very crucial part of the training is that we want each participant to be trained to complete a given task at the same level of accuracy as the expert would. We'll have goal-specific calibration processes that will uh, be dependent on the type of project and the desired outcome. So that's why I haven't designed any sort of hypothetical algorithms, because we don't know exactly yet what the task is going to be that anyone is doing. And of course, so the data is going to be checked uh, by experts. And I think this is actually something that, because cuneiformists can sometimes be a little bit protective of their data, I think this, is, this will be something that the experts will be actually quite willing to do. And certainly from the conversations with um, this, the cuneiformists that I had in New York, um, this was something that they would be very happy to do. So our next step then would be to consider what are the key elements of other successful citizen science projects? And who and what are our potential new um, demographics? So the, the British Museum has about 2,000 um, volunteer days per year, which means that they have about 10 people every day. And the age of these participants ranges from undergrads to people in their 80s. And the majority of the people that I thought was quite surprising who dedicate their own time to, to do work with Cuneiform is actually the age range of 30 to 50 year olds. I think I somehow live in this world where the seriology is full of old fogies, and I would have imagined that 90% of our volunteers are in their 90s, but that simply isn't the case. So I guess we want to know who, who would participate and why they would, and what data sets would they enjoy working with, and find a sort of golden data set where the, vol the, the um, participants love working with it, and what they generate is really useful for the, uh, for the discipline as a whole. And after all of that, we will need to consider the user interface because it's so massively important to the volunteer experience. I think that's something that we can't really start to design until we have answers to some of these questions. So having explained all this to the lady at Berkeley, she smiled and nodded and she said, OK, tell you what, let's develop a citizen science tool for cuneiform studies as a pedagogical tool and I'm now in talks with her with implementing this system uh, for teaching undergrads to learn cuneiform. And we hope to have something to sort of show and demo in the next couple of years. Oh, that's it. Thank you very much.